So we make the diagnosis of glaucoma based on intraocular pressure, do a gonioscopy to differentiate open angle and angle closure, and looking at the optic nerve carefully and doing the visual fields and corroborating the damage that the intraocular pressure or other factors have produced is what will establish the diagnosis. I think it is important to collect information on each of these parameters in a totally unbiased fashion and then interpret the findings in correlation with each other. More importantly, we need to appreciate the limitations and pitfalls while we gather information about each of these findings. While we are thinking about the diagnosis of glaucoma, we are worried because we don't want to be potentially missing a blinding disease and the misdiagnosis is going to be very costly on our responsibility as a doctor. But the patient's concerns once we make even a diagnosis of glaucoma suspect would be fear of impending blindness, especially if somebody in the family has gone blind. Once you make a diagnosis of glaucoma suspect, the patient remains a suspect throughout his life. Nobody is going to delabel him. The psychological trauma of the diagnosis and if the therapy is initiated, the th trauma of the over therapy. So talking about intraocular pressure, the only message I want to give is that non-contact tonometer cannot be used to make either diagnosis or follow-up glaucoma patients. Because the pressure is measured in such a short span of time, 1 by 500 of the cardiac cycle, the variability is enormous. And if you do end up an example of what can happen. So the patient was started, 38-year-old lady on timolol. The pressures were not controlled. Dorzolamide was added and then bimetoprost was added. The pressures are still not controlled. The patient was advised surgery. Then she came to us. The discs were completely normal, the angles were open, the fields were completely normal and over a period of time we took out all the therapy and with an application tonometer pressure remains normal. So non-contact tonometer is a screening tool if at all and sitting in the glaucoma in the practice we are not screening patients, we are doing a comprehensive examination. So a non-contact tonometer actually does not belong in the clinic is my message, should not be used to diagnose or <clears throat> manage follow-up. As far as gonioscopy is concerned, this is the only instrument that can differentiate between primary angle closure suspect and primary angle closure that will decide whether you need to do an iridotomy or not. <clears throat> While doing gonioscopy, we need to answer two questions. As a starting, at, a, at, the, at the time when I was starting my gonioscopy, the target is whether I have seen the trabecular meshwork or not. If that is the target, then all angle closure glaucomas will be missed. So the first important thing is, is the angle occludable and for that we need to make sure that the room is dark, the slit lamp illumination does not fall on the pupil and there is no indentation or manipulation allowing the pupil to dilate to its maximum and then assess the gap between the cornea and the iris. Having made that judgment, then you can go on to see what else is there in the angle and what pathology you are looking at. So an example of an occludable angle on indentation opens up with a blotchy pigment there that is indicative of angle closure. So if you are doing only this and don't pay attention to the blotchy pigment, you will probably end up treating this as an open angle glaucoma while the patient has primary angle closure. What looks like a pigmentation on the back of the cornea on indentation turns out what looks like a trabecular meshwork is actually a pigmentation on the back of the cornea indicating angle closure made up by indentation. What looks like a synechia, once you do indentation, disappears. These are peripheral bulges on the iris that look like synechia, but they are not true synechia. A closed angle opening on indentation with a hemispherical bulge on indentation that turns out to be a ciliary body cyst. So if you increase our skill on gonioscopy, it's like a UBM in your pocket. You can make out much more changes. While the imaging technologies are beautiful to look at, because their magnification is so high, they are looking only at a very, very small part of the angle. For you to make a clinical diagnosis, you need to be looking at 360 degrees of the angle. While the newer technologies of imaging probably can do that, they cannot do indentation. So your management of angle closure glaucoma cannot be done if you don't do gonioscopy. And it's important to remember that in our current context, angle closure disease can masquerade as glaucoma suspect because we see the disc only after dilation. We haven't done the gonioscopy. Ocular hypertension is a diagnosis that can be made only if you have made a good gonioscopy. Normal tension glaucoma, I have seen patients being treated as normal tension glaucoma where actually the disease is angle closure. Intermittent pressure rise, disc damage is produced, 
angles, chamber is deep, but angles are occludable. Even if you diagnose primary open angle glaucoma, over a period of time, they can go on to develop angle closure disease. So we need to do repeating gonioscopy every year. So looking at the optic disc, I think the most important lesson to learn is that this small disc that looks perfectly healthy is glaucoma and all the other three are physiological variations of the optic disc because of the variable disc size. Looking at the disc, trying to draw the diagram is the only way we will probably pay attention to detail. A large disc, even if it is glaucomatous, can make you overestimate the amount of damage. Between those two, these two discs, both are glaucoma, the damage in the right side image is much less, much more than the damage in the larger disc. So it, you tend to overestimate. Ultimate goal should be, we not only make a diagnosis of glaucoma, but by looking at the nerve fiber layer changes and the notch, actually see how much of damage is likely to be there. All superior field damage, but the severity of damage can be made out by looking at the nerve fiber layer loss. This looks like, this is an unreliable visual field, but there are some depressed points in the inferior points. The optic disc evaluation shows that there is a superior nerve fiber layer defect. So even this unreliable visual field, because it correlates with your clinical examination, very early loss, not satisfying all three Anderson's criteria, can be a diagnosis of glaucoma. If you are not confident about picking up this early change on the optic nerve head, then you go on to do imaging. And the imaging shows that in the left eye, there is a superior nerve fiber layer loss, superior GCPIL loss that correlates with what you are suspecting clinically. So that is what makes the diagnosis. If you see a disc like this, where there is damage, both superior pole and inferior pole here, only superior pole here, and the red of the imaging and the green black of the visual field are matching with each other. So that's what makes the diagnosis. On the other hand, there is red everywhere, the disc is healthy, the black is not there of the visual field. So that's a false positive. That's what you need to remember. So this disc looked normal to me, but the patient had a repeatable visual field defect in the superior hemisphere. Then I depend on imaging. Don't go by the averages, but look at this super pixel loss inferiorly. So that is how we need to use imaging. Because early glaucoma is where you need imaging, and the damage takes place only in one hemisphere, either your disc or your field that you suspect should correlate with the damage that you see on the imaging. But just by looking at imaging, you cannot diagnose somebody as having preperimetric glaucoma. So we talked about the patient's concerns and the doctor's concerns. One last point, maybe take a little more second. We worry about the blindness in glaucoma without realizing the natural history of the disease. What this study showed is that the progression to glaucoma, glaucoma is very small if you look at the natural course of the disease. All diagnosed as glaucoma, extrapolated progression, there are a significant number that actually improve, significant number that progress but do not go visually handicapped, and a very small number go to handicap and blindness. That is what we need to differentiate when we deal with a patient. Overdiagnosis in the early disease, missing the established disease, and under treatment in severe disease are the ones that we need to be careful about. Thank you for your attention.